Hello, and welcome to our job costing training titled Providing Essential Information for a Profitable Construction, Engineering, or Trucking Company. This training is brought to you by Project Solutions. Project Solutions, or PSI, is contracted by the North Dakota Department of Transportation to provide DBE supportive services to certified firms. We are committed to providing training and guidance that will help firms grow and build their business management potential. To accomplish this, we are continually developing live and recorded sessions on relevant topics to assist in your business potential. All our services are provided free of cost to certified firms. If you would like more information about our services, please contact us at dbe at projectsolutionsinc.com. My name is Carrie Bullion. I work for PSI, and I'm going to talk about job costing today. Everyone can benefit from it. Job costing is essential to any business's bottom line, but it's especially crucial in the construction industry. The ability to effectively and accurately estimate your job costs on a project can set you up for success or put you on a course for disaster. Most importantly, there is a disclaimer here that you can read. I want to just summarize and say we are going to give you examples as illustrations with an intent to help you decide what works best for you and how you're going to run your business. You are, we are not responsible for how you bid or your success of bidding. I want to start by sharing our agenda. Today, I want to talk about what does job costing mean? Why does a contractor need to job cost in their business? In this presentation, I will talk about what expenses count as job costs and what does not. This presentation is designed to look at different roles in your company and have people in your company get behind you on job costing concepts to get people supporting the process. We will also look at calculating fully burdened labor rates. I will share some effective techniques to facilitate that process. Another is tracking equipment and job labor costs to a job. Equipment is an overhead cost, but we need to know the equipment cost on a job, how that's being tracked, and we'll show you some ideas there. I'll also talk about the impact of change orders on job costing, pricing mistakes, pointers to implement job costing practices in your business, and applying or using job cost information in the business. There will be two sides to this presentation. One is the accounting side, and the other is the paperwork from the field. Do any of these situations sound familiar? One, job is physically half complete, and you're not sure where you're at on budget. Two, it's Monday and the crew doesn't know the production expectation for the week. Three, the ABC job is complete and you're using some of the cash from a different job to pay for the final bills for the ABC job. Four, the job is over and the company is looking good, bills paid, cash left over. Job costing reports will identify if your company problem is job profitability, overhead, or a combination. There's smoke, but I can't find the fire. You're struggling getting the profit of the company right. You're not sure where to attack it. None of the above mentioned cannot be addressed without job costing. The challenges. Job costing is an accounting function. Construction accounting is roughly 15% of all accounting. So cost accounting is given very little attention in schools, colleges, and universities. The challenge is trying to find people to help you do this. You need to find somebody who has been around it frequently. Your accountant may do your taxes, but understanding what you may need may not be in their wheelhouse. Construction accounting is used in mobile environments, which means having a bookkeeping system that can track the costs that are incurred related to doing work in a strictly mobilization environment is difficult. Programming your accounting software to correctly track and account for all costs is critical. Getting buy-in from ownership, management, superintendents, crew leaders, Everybody is essential.
The primary goal of job costing is to determine the overall price and profitability of a particular job. For example, a job might cost $10,000. Your company might break even on the job or end up losing money if the cost is higher than the job revenue. It is po also possible for a job to cost $10,000 and earn a profit of $10,000. Another goal of job costing is to help your company evaluate and determine which jobs will earn a profit and which ones won't. With job costing, you can decide to move forward on projects that will help your bottom line. You can also choose to pass on those projects which you don't believe will earn money or which might end up costing more than the sale price. You can also use job costing to figure out if a similar project you decide to work on in the future will turn a profit or not. Based on the results of one job, you might realize that a particular type of project is a losing game. Going forward, you might decide to focus your efforts on different kinds of projects. With job costing, you get a sense of whether your estimates are accurate or not. For example, based on your calculations, you expected a project to cost $25,000 and to earn a profit of $15,000. Once the project was over, you realized that the true cost of it was $35,000 and your profit ended up being $5,000. You can compare the numbers used during job costing to actual numbers to figure out what the issue was. It might be that you expected your team to spend 100 hours working on a project at $25 per hour. It could be the case they spent double the time estimated, 200 hours, or that individual employees worked more than 40 hours per week regularly, so you had to play overtime. In either case, your direct labor cost ended up being more than planned. Going forward, you can account for higher labor costs for similar projects to hopefully turn a better profit on that project. One of the final goals of job costing process is to help your business maintain accurate records. When you have a complete detailed breakdown of the cost of a particular project, you have an accurate record of what your business spent on that project. Having records that are detailed and correct will help you when it's time to make decisions about the future of your company. Job costing, when properly implemented, can help you accurately assess the actual cost to do a project or job. You can assess a job at any stage of the project and use it to make business decisions. Fine tune your estimates and identify variances from the bid. You can improve the company's estimating proficiency, check for accuracy, quality control, production rate, project supervision. You can segregate overhead from job cost and determine pricing formulas. Was the project profitable? Were we accurate? Did we hit the target? There is a lesson to be learned from each project. Once the process is going, you will find it's not as difficult as you think and worth the extra work. Pros of job costing. One, it allows you to compare the cost of a job to its profit. With the job order costing method, you can determine how much you are going to spend on a particular project in advance. You can then see how the cost of the project compare to what your company can earn. Two, it allows you to determine profit productivity. Another benefit of job costing is that it allows you to assess your employee's productivity. If you estimate hours spent on a project and it turns out the team actually spends more time, you can take a closer look at what went wrong, see what changed. It might also be a case that you realize that one employee is much more productive than others. Going forward, you might use that employee more than the people who work slowly. Three, it can help you avoid mistakes. Thanks to job costing, you have a fair idea of total costs and profitability before you begin a project. If you look at the numbers and see that a job won't have a significant enough payoff, you can turn it down and focus your energy on more profitable opportunities instead. Four, it can grow your, with your business. Construction companies, large and small, can use job costing to compare costs and profits. As your company takes on new projects, you can continue to use the job costing to make business decisions. Five, it helps you create a budget for your company. How much are you spending on labor and materials? What are your overhead costs? Since job costing requires you to hammer out the details for each project, it can be a useful tool to use when putting together an overall company budget. 
Cons of job costing. One, it can be labor intensive. The process of job costing, specifically initial setup, does require a fair amount of effort on your part. You need to have a grasp on the number of direct labor hours, the cost of direct materials and overhead costs. It can take some time to come up with the figures you need for the process to work. Two, it requires a lot of documentation. Job costing can also involve a lot of paperwork and documentation. You want documentation of hours worked, supplies purchased, and equipment used. The more complicated the job, the more paperwork needed. Three, it doesn't necessarily help you control costs. Another drawback of job costing is that it might not be a useful tool for managing or minimizing costs. Job costing will show you what a project is going to cost, but you might not get a sense of what you can do to reduce expenses on a particular project. You will get a sense of whether a project is worth working on or not worth working on. Four, it requires some guesswork, especially at the beginning. There is some guesswork involved in job costing. If you're building a particular size or style of home for the first time, you might not have an accurate idea of the labor costs involved. You might underestimate those costs and miss out on profit, or you might turn down a job because you overestimate labor and material costs and determine the gain isn't substantial enough. Five, it requires company-wide buy-in. Without everyone's support and participation, the information used will not be accurate and cannot effectively help you. Managing the cost of a project is perhaps the primary function of most project managers. Job costing is an accounting method designed to help you track the cost of individual projects and jobs. Let's break that definition down. Job costing involves the accumulation of the direct and indirect costs. It is usually broken down into the costs of materials, labor, equipment, and overhead for a specific job. It's not the rolled up cost, just the basic cost. Utilizes a special type of accounting called cost accounting. Certified public accountants tend to focus on public accounting instead of cost accounting. They use more of a rear view mirror image of a business instead of looking forward. So cost accounting is not a part of their regular focus. Project management tool. Cost accounting is part of project management. It is an administrative function that requires coordination of a number of team members. Success of this starts with you. Job costing can be programmed. Using the accounting ledger and software is the first step to that process. Technology can help support the systems you have created, specifically the items covered in 4 and 5. Successful implementation of a thorough job costing process takes a company-wide approach, starting at the top. What are job costs? Simply money paid for costs, specifically for or attributable to a single project. It can include labor, cost of equipment, job materials, subcontractors, small tools, and project-related costs. The following slide covers specific job costs. I'll go into more depth, but wanted to start with an overview of what is included in job costs. Labor includes Wages paid to workers on the project. Please note, supervisor's time to supervise on the job would not count. Only time working on the project would count. Separate workers' payroll into several categories. Time worked on a project, pay for hours worked devoted to training, pay for Davis-Bacon, pay for holiday, vacation, sick pay, labor burden. Labor burden refers to the additional costs of an employer plays to have employees. It is the value added onto direct wages to understand the actual cost per unit of wages paid for an employee. Labor burden includes taxes and compliance, employee benefits, operational costs of having an employee. It's not uncommon for this to calculate at 50% or more of the wage amount. Cost for equipment, time used. Rates include 
fuel, oil, and gas costs, repairs, depreciation, and it's based on established weekly rates. Job materials, subcontractors, small tools or parts used for a specific job, project-related costs, mobilization, field office expenses, performance bonds, payment bonds, job insurance. Projects versus operations. Most construction, engineering, and trucking services or jobs are a project. Projects have a specific time frame, a start date and an end date. They have a unique end result, a product that is created. It's important to set a budget and remain in the budget. It isn't unusual for a project to have temporary employees. You have a specific window of time to get it right. Now let's look at operations, which are continuous in nature. Restaurants are a prime example of an operation. They are doing the same thing every day, ongoing. They have a chance to fix things as they go along. But construction projects, not so much. Operations are ongoing without an end date. They repeat the same output. They have a permanent staff. They often require a capital investment. Project or operation, each one requires a different record keeping process to measure results. This funnel helps illustrate where we hope to get things going with a business. At the top of our funnel are the typical components of direct cost of labor. Timesheets, equipment used on the job site, superintendent, foreman, materials delivered, subcontractors, that all gets put in at the top. Then at the next level includes the billing, the AIA documents, accounts receivables aside, the accounts payable, and the payroll all funnel together to create job cost information, which is going to lead us to the accounting piece. I'm going to talk about QuickBooks because many business owners use QuickBooks. So we're going to start there. For QuickBooks users, this screen should look familiar. First thing we need to do before your job cost is create a new job under the customer. I have a screenshot and I'm logged in under the sample company which is called Quality Build Construction. So this is a set of books for Quality Build Construction which is the sample company. So you can see here I've circled quality built construction and shop time in green. These are shown as jobs for the customer under quality built construction. They represent some of the service items that are created in QuickBooks. We have items called shop time, admin, bidding, client meeting, marketing. Later you'll see we also use landscaping. They will be convenient and handy to use when you do payroll. I've also circled up top here where you'd want to add a customer in the job. We have Campbell, Heather, and the sub job is a house called New Construction. Later on with Heather Campbell, we may need to add a job like a garage. When you do this, you can see each customer has a sub job. You can see Gary Weisinger has a couple jobs. If you don't want to name your jobs, you could also use bid numbers or contract numbers. You may do several jobs for the same customer and you'll want to create a new job underneath this customer for each one. You will be billing to the job underneath the customer. Assign all bills from subcontractors for labor, materials, and equipment to this new job. You want to enter this when you get the invoice, when the purchase occurs. It's not advisable to work off of statements. It should become part of your daily routine whenever you receive an invoice or a bill. Make sure to always take it to the right customer and the right job. Here we are taking the project to Heather Campbell House New Construction. Have the superintendent or project manager first approve the invoice so you know the material and invoicing is accurate. Then have them mark that invoice for what customer or job it is and what cost code to use. Now let's talk about entering bills. I encourage you to always enter the bill not just write the check. When the bill comes in your door, let's say Monday morning, and you're putting it in, enter it as a bill. It's very helpful for tracking expenses. 
This screen is where you can see the expenses and the items. In this example, we're buying 50 tons of gravel at $100, costing $5,000 total. And then we have the class. This is the material cost job related class. It can be used a lot of different ways, and that's a training for a whole other time, but I wanted to show you how to attach this material cost to this job. We also have a box here called billable. Everything you buy is going to be paid for by somebody. It becomes part of your job cost, but it's not necessarily going to be billed directly to the customer. If you click this box, you, it will roll directly onto an invoice. It's likely a cost has already been created when you estimated the job, so there isn't a reason to mark it in this case. Typically, contractors don't use a billable field on any job they've estimated. I've seen the billable feature used on change orders or on time and materials jobs. Okay, so we've set up the customer using a bill from the vendor for work on this customer's project. Next thing we're going to do is talk about payroll. Doing payroll is a training topic by itself, but I want to show you the steps to job cost payroll and how to set it up. Each payroll item can have different hourly wages. Davis-Bacon position or labor rates, fringe benefits can be programmed as a percentage or a fixed dollar amount. So I wanted to walk through one example. In this example, I am showing Chris Pepper and it looks like he is a laborer. You can see I've circled him in blue. Each job has a different hourly wage. As you look in the column under earnings that I have circled in gray, you can see for roofing the wage is $21 an hour, carpentry $22, electrical $23, office is $21, and so is vacation. For our illustration, you can see in his profile I have different tasks that he is going to be doing, including the non-billable type pay, like office and vacation. On the right, circled in blue, the fringe benefit rates have been programmed as a percentage. They can also be programmed as a fixed dollar. In this example, we use percentages. QuickBook allows you to build templates in your preferences for these things, which can make it a lot easier, especially if you have to set up multiple employees. There's a lot more involved in payroll setup, but this shows the pieces necessary to facilitate job costing. Old school or high tech, make sure you separate job labor from any other type of payroll. If the goal is to determine accurate job costs and employee productivity, only count the actual labor performed on the job site. Filter out everything else. So let's pretend that this is Chris's timesheet. You can see on Monday that he worked at the cruise house. Tuesday, he worked at the Campbell house and the shop. Wednesday, he had a few hours on admin. So each of these jobs and names relate back to what we created in QuickBooks. Those are all specific titles from the QuickBooks setup. It all is going to tie together. This is a manual time card example, and at the end of the week, Chris is going to total it up and he will sign it. His superintendent or foreman is also going to approve it, and then it's going to be turned into payroll. A lot of people do payroll this way manually, which is fine. Once you get a little bigger, there are tools out there that QuickBooks has that are accessible to use if you want to get away from just doing spreadsheets. The best method for tracking payroll and job costs? There are many options. We have listed a few. QuickBooks, Sage, Foundation. Only you can decide what is best for your company. If you're using a payroll service, allocating wages to jobs and categories requires a couple more steps and can be time consuming. You can end up doing everything but writing the actual check. Payroll services tend to be a great fit for operation types businesses like restaurants, retail, wholesalers. For project-based businesses like construction companies, we rarely see outsourced payroll. It's something to think about. If you decide to use your accounting system instead of spreadsheets, you will likely find that it eliminates duplicating work, jobs are tracked as the bills for each purchase are processed, job payroll is job costed as paychecks are written, tends to be more accurate, you're able to retrieve payment, payroll, billing history, on demand and in real time. It's timely, you're able to print job cost reports at any time. 
Accounting system programming and staff training are really the key to this process. Each department needs the other in order for job costing to be successful. This is one option available, and it is called QuickBooks Time. It used to be T-Sheets. They recently switched it. Um, this is easy to use. And I'm going to put a disclaimer out there. We're not hired by QuickBooks. It's just extremely convenient. The office setup is significant, not daunting, just detailed. You just have to follow all the steps. It can become a game changer for contractors with web-based timekeeping for smartphones. They do require the setup. Employee can control their time entry. You're able to post to only approve jobs and tasks. You can still have two layers of approval. The user interface is easy, and it does sync with QuickBooks, which makes it easy for the different departments to work well together. For payroll, we've got an example of a timesheet here. For payroll, we're going to assign each hour worked to a job with a service item and a payroll item. Whether the timesheet is done manually or imported to QuickBooks from an app, the QuickBook timesheet should look like this before the paychecks are written. On the far left, you can see that that job relates back specifically to the customers that are in the profile. Managing payroll this way with a service can be very difficult, meaning a payroll service, not a service item. Categorizing the wages to different customers for different kinds of work, your service items, at different kinds of pay becomes cumbersome when using a third-party system. So using QuickBooks, I have set up the customers, entered a bill, done payroll, and now we need to create an invoice for this customer. Now we're going to create an invoice for the same customer. For the landscaping being billed, the worker Chris Pepper had eight hours at $22 an hour, which is $176, plus $5,000 of materials purchased. The materials and labor are being billed at $7,500. So we've completed the basic step um, from the accounting perspective in capturing labor and materials. Let's do a deeper look at the job costing of labor burden and equipment. So this is our invoice. We're going to build this invoice for Heather Campbell House Project. We're going to bill her for the gravel brought, bought. Then we're going to charge her $7,500. We paid $5,000 for it. And at the same time, we have to add in Chris Pepper at eight hours. It'll give you an idea of how things are done. In this example, we're billing for just the gravel, but you could bill it out as a phase of the project or something different than that. Um, you probably wouldn't just bill for gravel. That's all I'm saying. Um, I just wanted to make it a simple example when creating an invoice for a customer. We had the customer, we bought some materials, we did some payroll, and now we're creating an invoice. Next, we can run reports. What is labor burden? This slide shows the items that can be included in your labor burden. Labor burden is the actual cost of the company to have an employee, aside from the salary the employee earns. There are different benefits and taxes to be paid, but no matter what, no matter what you are doing, most of us have a burden to pay. I'm going to go through the steps you can use to calculate labor burden. I'm going to show you a slick way to accumulate the cost you need for bidding and show what your labor is really costing. The fully burden labor rate that encompasses all burden labor costs into one percentage can be calculated. Everybody has their own way of calculating burden. This is a kind of a shortcut weight that might, might be useful to you. Applying then this percentage to direct labor wages is an efficient and accurate method to put together a labor bid. A thought about labor burden, especially in a prevailing wage environment, Davis-Bacon, your competitors have much the same challenges as you. All firms have to have the same prevailing wage and benefits. Let's talk about the components. I'm going to show you a method to calculate a fully burdened labor rate it covers all the burden costs into 1%. Everyone has their own way of calculating the burden costs, but this is a shortcut that might be useful. By applying this percentage to direct burden costs is an efficient and accurate method to put together a labor bid. For payroll taxes, everybody has to play the employer side. State and federal unemployment taxes can vary by company. Workers' compensation rates are determined by industry and company claims experience. 
and it all gets put together. Calculating labor burden, payroll taxes. Your payroll taxes are comprised of a bunch of different items, including federal social security, federal Medicare, unemployment at the federal level, unemployment at the state level, varies by state and your company history, your estimated personal taxes withheld from the employee's pay is not a cost of the employer, it's not part of the burden. So here we have our 21.15 times federal social security, federal Medicare, federal unemployment, and state unemployment. That totals up to $1.79 per hour in this example. Calculating labor burden, workers' compensation. Cost of insurance is directly attributed to the work being done. Premiums are based on the risk of the work. What trade has the highest construction work comp rates? The lowest work comp rates? I looked up a few for comparisons. Roofers are typically about 20%. Landscape is about 9%. Painting, 5%. Underwater welders was the winner at 100%, or maybe the loser. Um, we also have to consider the percentage factor to each wage base to calculate the burden. Companies with lower loss ratios or no claims will have lower premiums and less burden to pass on. Your competitors are facing the same burdens as you, so work comp is one place where you can differentiate yourself. In this example, we have a base wage of 21.15. Our work comp rate is 5%, so the burden is going to be that 21.15 times 0.05 or $1.06 per hour for work comp. Calculating the benefits. More benefits are being offered to hourly workers in order to attract and retain a more stable workforce. Um, types of company paid benefits. These are ones that would meet the criteria of a bona fide as required by Davis-Bacon regulations, but paid holidays, vacation or PTO pay, sick pay, health, life, dental, retirement plans, match of employer's contribution up to 4% can count as well. Um, retirement plans must be third-party depository and administered. Profit sharing to purchase company stock does not qualify as bona fide. Calculating cost of job labor, Davis-Bacon benefits. Davis-Bacon benefits are defined based on a per hour rate or a percentage. If it's going to be paid in the form of a paycheck, then it is considered income to tax, same as an hourly wage would be. If you do your payroll in QuickBooks, you can have the base wage and then the Davis-Bacon benefit as a separate line item. Some companies will roll these into one number and show them combined. Just make sure you can prove the wage was paid correctly and that you have separate documentation to prove that. Davis-Bacon regulations, each employee will receive a base wage plus fringe benefits, based on the wage determination documents supplied with each project. Payment for fringe benefits, it can be paid in the form of an addition to a paycheck, then it's considered that income and taxed as an hourly wage, or benefits can be paid by the employer to offset those Davis-Bacon fringe benefits. In this example in the blue box, we've got a fringe benefit required of $2.90 per hour. The company has group health insurance and the employer pays 50% of the employee's premium. So on a monthly premium of $400, the cost to the employer is $200 per month or $2,400 per year. We can convert that benefit to an hourly wage by dividing the $2,400 by the 20, 80 hours per year, which equals $1.15 per hour. So Davis-Bacon fringe that's paid to the employee is $290 minus $1.15 which means we've got to pay $1.75 as a cash payment since there are no other benefits to attribute to that fringe. Calculating the cost of labor. So here is a summary of how that process works. John Smith is a bulk concrete laborer with one year of experience. His pay, according to Davis Bacon, is $21.15 an hour plus $2.90 in fringe benefits for $24.05. So we have, again, there's some assumptions in here, but Payroll taxes is 6.2% um, FICA plus 1.45% Medicare times that 2405 is $1.84. Unemployment taxes, assuming 2.9% up to 
4,500 is equal to $710 per year. If you divide that by the number of hours, you're at 34 cents per hour. Then there's health insurance, which we talked about earlier, um, and your retirement plan. So you've got your $1.15 and your 25 cents. So company paid per hour is at $1.40. Davis Bacon is $2.90, so you've got $1.50 due as cash. Um, since Davis Bacon does require more than what the company is paying, then workers' compensation, it's not a benefit, but it is a direct cost attributable to job labor. That rate is $5 per 100. So 5% times the 24.05 equals $1.21. So you've got your FICA, unemployment, health, 401, Davis-Bacon fringe, work comp, that total number is going to equal your labor burden per hour. So when we add that up, it's $6.29. You can divide that by your total base wage of the 21.15, which equals 30% labor burden, or you can take that times that number then to get your total cost. So you're going to see how it all works out. No matter the hour hourly wage, if you add 30% to every dollar, your labor burden should be captured. That's, of course, assuming you figured everything out based on accurate information. Um, you know, you take your 2115 plus your 635 to equal 2750, which is your burden labor rate. Add the burden first, then add your overhead and profit. So remember to not count work comp or health insurance as part of your insurance overhead. You're including that with your labor burden. Um, I also want to bring up that why we do 21.15 times 30% and not 24.05 times 30%, it's because fringe is rolled into the burden rate. So make sure you're always redoing these calculations after each construction season annually at a minimum. You want to make sure you're using the right information to figure these numbers out. Job costing for company-owned equipment. Um, this is not for rented or leased equipment. It's easy to assign costs to the appropriate job as payments and bills are paid. Job costing equipment requires coordination between the job site supervisor and the bookkeeping personnel. Think of equipment the same way you would think about employees. You need a rate. So, you know, the biggest challenge for contractors is how to equitably apply total equipment costs to jobs. Are the rates being used for billing appropriate? Are they accurate? So step one would be determine a billing and bidding rate for owned equipment. In this example, they're not necessarily accurate figures or averages. We've taken a list of all equipment owned by this company and defined rates by week or by month or however you want to do it internally. Think about the going rate, what's the markup rate, what's the actual costs. In step one, you're going to need a billing rate for the equipment it's kind of like an employee. Each employee is paid an hourly wage. You need to do the same thing for the equipment. Step two would be to track all the equipment costs and put them into their own bucket of expense. Uh, create an overhead count called equipment costs. Charge all expense accounts related to the equipment to the sub accounts of this new account. You've got your fuel, oil, gas, repairs and maintenance, depreciation, tires, other parts, mechanics, tools, equipment or garage overhead, if you have a dedicated garage, and mechanics wages. Then create an equipment timesheet template. This will be used for each project. Have a new sheet each week. Each job has one master equipment timesheet and a new one is created each week. The next thing that each job would have a sheet like this, we have a week, and then in the column on the left, you can put down which equipment you're using and fill it out as you go to calculate your costs. So in step three, we're going to create an equipment timesheet. This should be done for every project. This is the Smith project. This spreadsheet represents the equipment on the job site that is being used. You can see that some of the equipment uses a per mile method, others use a per hour, and others are by day or week. How many hours or units are used during this week is represented on this timesheet. You can see it's totaled up to a total cost of $6,940 
That's based on the equipment that was used for this specific job. Now the accounting department is going to take this out of overhead and apply it to the job costs for the Smith project. Trucking contractors also have a process for calculating their mileage or hourly rate. You're going to have to pull together some information, the number of miles driven in a period, the longer the better, or the number of hours in operation. Then you're going to take your cost bucket, which is your method of tracking all your costs for a year or some other frame of time that you've chosen. You've got your fuel oil grease, repairs and maintenance, depreciation, tires and other parts, storage, tolls and load fees, license, insurance. Total all those up and divide by either the number of miles or the number of hours during the period you've chosen. And then you can add overhead and profit to get a rate that you would charge to your customers. As you develop QuickBooks capabilities, you will want to create the project budget in QuickBooks so you can run reports like this. Please note, if you have a project budget entered into QuickBooks, it can help you see how a change order can impact your reporting also. QuickBooks contractor version has a change order function to update project cost and revenue estimates. If you're putting estimates into QuickBooks, you'll be able to have reports like this. This example is a report generated for one sample job called Wilson Brandon, a custom house. This report shows the details of that one project. Once information is input, you can see the actual total cost of the project, which comes in at just over 81,000. You have assessed your estimate accuracy by comparing it to your estimated cost, which is almost 77,000. Your estimate was either off by $7,000 or there were change orders. This made a decent profit. They made just over $30,000. You can tell by looking at the actual revenue, $113,400 less the actual cost, $81,660. Here is the sample profit and loss statement. Job cost information is in the red bracket. Job cost is where the real opportunities arise for improvement on the bottom line. Overhead is in the blue bracket. The overhead typically is what it is. You may be able to fine tune it a bit. But for those of you that job costs are going to job cost, focusing on the red area should bring about the most results. Here we have two job cost reports from QuickBooks. The left report is all jobs noted by summary. The right side is one specific job. The cost column information comes from invoices and paychecks charged to those items. Revenue doesn't post against those items, but instead has another item for FP billing. On the left side is the company's all jobs, not just one. On the right is the one job. These reports show some of what's possible if you do job costing in real time. This can provide great information for your superintendents. It can have a huge impact on measurement. This is a tool you can have if you have job costing implemented. If you do multiple lines of work, it helps to see your average and it helps to see what is the most and least profitable of the lines of work you do. In this example, the gross profit is calculated for the company as a whole. And it's calculated for the Gary Weisinger Guest Cottage Project. To calculate the gross profit, we're taking the difference of your revenue less your cost, divided by your total revenue. Here's a sample job cost report. This is shown to give you a rough idea of what you can do with the information generated from QuickBooks. If you look at the blue shaded area, that area that is shaded is an example of a report exported to Excel from QuickBooks. The area that is white represents information calculated using the numbers that are highlighted in blue. This is an example of a report that we use to check project status.
We use the information from QuickBooks to calculate and determine things like project cost to date, percentage of project used, and the total percentage used of the estimated cost. We have also calculated this information based on billing. We've also calculated the gross margin and cost to complete. At the top of the spreadsheet, you will see the formulas we use to calculate this information. This project is actually close to complete or is complete, so some of the numbers don't work the best, but I'm hoping that it serves the purpose for which the presentation is intended, and I hope it helps you see the potential benefits to job costing and how it can support a project-based business. If you have any questions about the formulas or how to use the information, please give us a call or send us an email. We're happy to help. Job costing mistakes. Count a cost in both overhead and job cost. Workers' compensation premiums should only be counted once. We also went through how to calculate labor burden. Everything is in that one percentage. Well, if you look at financial statements and you had those benefits in overhead, you'd want to pull those lines out as you look to create your overhead rate. You also need to be careful when including equipment costs. If you have to buy a piece of equipment for a job, you might not be able to count the entire cost towards that one project. For example, if you need to buy a $4,000 generator, your customer probably doesn't want to buy that generator. Even if you need it for the job, you should only include the cost attributable to that one job. The balance would go into overhead or later jobs. It is tempting to put everything but the kitchen sink into a job cost, but in reality, to be competitive, you have to input just the cost attributable to that one project. Charging all works hours as job labor. Make sure you make those distinctions. Costs such as shop time, holiday, training should all be excluded. Charging too much for equipment. If you own your fleet, you can be cheaper than the other person that might have to rent. If you're pricing equipment at the rental rate, but your competitors can use the ownership rate, there will likely be a difference in cost. It's something to think about. Underestimating mobilization costs, meaning costs when you win the job, start the work, and all that needs to go in between there. Look at the site of work. They aren't all the same. Consider factors that can influence the norm. Always question what you put in your bid. This is not an exhaustive list, but will hopefully help you avoid some common mistakes of job costing. Some pointers to implement or improve your job costing practices in your business. General ledger accounts are to be set up separate from overhead. Project estimate with cost, markup, and revenue is entered into the accounting system. You can kind of see that sample job cost report. Appropriate label code labor codes for payroll are set up. Make sure the correct wage is used for estimating, timekeeping sheets with job codes that are ready for job start, multiple payroll items per employee, including job labor, shop labor, holiday vacation, training wages, benefits for Davis-Bacon, all of those items. Pointers to implement or improve job costing practices in your business continued. Four. Owned equipment inventory sheets are up to date. Billing rates are defined. Five, account for all project costs using receipts. Don't use bank or credit card statements to verify job costs. Insist on receipts. The receipt, invoice, for each expenditure is job coded by the project manager or super. Seven, after each month, track all costs not charged to a job. Run the cost report expenses not charged to jobs. This process requires coordination, communication, and follow through of both office and field personnel in order to be successful. Keeping a job profitable, I think that's kind of everyone's goal, but um, we want to make sure crew leaders know the work schedules every week at a minimum, that you're tracking labor hours by tasks, and that use that history and information to benefit the estimating department. Compare your actual job cost to the estimate. Compare your actual schedule duration to the estimate. Evaluate each project for lessons learned. The most successful setups for job costing are limited by the ability to reliably gather the detailed cost information from the field. Questions. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. 
we're here to help. We can be reached via email or phone. I mentioned our DBE email. I also have a direct email that you can use to reach out to me. Happy to help in any way that I can. Uh, my contact information is listed and you can always call the office as well. Please let us know how we can be of help. Thank you for your time today and have a great day.